um, a lot of people's Zoom. Uh, Minnie, is it open the Zoom yet? Okay. Um, so we'll start. We'll start shortly. Um, there's a uh, sort of what I try and do with the events for English speakers, which is my area here, is, is to start exactly on time as a message to the Israelis that it is possible. <laughs> <laughs> Not always appreciated by <laughs> my native born friend. Um, but um, yeah, so for those that aren't regulars here or don't know me, um, my name is Paul Gross and I run the English content and programs here at the Centre. Um, if you are not on my mailing list and would like to be and receive information about the events that we do for English speakers, either in person or on Zoom, we have them every couple of weeks, usually, um, sometimes more than that then drop me an email, paulg at begancentre.org.il. Oh, I had that. Okay, it's now recorded. Hi, Zoom, hi, Zoom participants. Um, okay, so I know we have a, a very large number of people registered for Zoom, so I can think of people uh, in the UK, certainly, given the topic, but also our regulars in the United States and Canada and elsewhere. Um, today, uh, it may have escaped some people's attention, but today is the six-month anniversary of... Uh, October 7th. Um, so uh, I am, it, 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 it wasn't deliberately planned for this day, but I am happy that we are doing something on this day. Mm -hmm. because, um, uh, sadly, there'll be many other occasions where we'll be marking um, the uh, momentous, terrible events of that day. Um, but certainly the six month anniversary is, is, should not go un, unremarked. Um, so I'm, I'm glad we're doing something. Um, we've had a couple of events, uh, main, I think mainly online, where we've discussed uh, what's been happening in the United States on campuses. Um, some of you would have tuned in for those. Um, and clearly, the United States, with its very large Jewish population, um, and also the, the reality of the, the, the importance of the U.S.-Israel relationship, um, that's something that we, we focus on an awful lot. Um, but I wanted to talk about um, the UK, not just because, as you may have guessed, you didn't already, I'm from the UK, um, but also um, because I think it's representative of other things that are happening in, in other parts of the world, in places where there are smaller Jewish populations in the United States, where the, where the Jewish population, Jewish community is maybe less self-confident and less... Um, um, sort of plug it into uh, the, the, the corridor's power um, as they are, uh, as they have been in the United States for longer. Um, so I wanted to talk about that and I had a wonderful opportunity because our guest today, David Hirsch, is visiting the country um, and, um, and he is the uh, CEO um, of a remarkable organization which was founded not that long ago, right David? Well, <clears throat> yeah, about a year and a half ago. A year and a half ago, right? The London Centre for the Study of Contemporary Antisemitism. So we're going to talk to David um, about, <clears throat> about his work, about his centre, um, which would be interesting in any event, but I think particularly interesting in light of October 7th, and, and in light of the fact that David's centre has um, is publishing a, um, a remarkable series of books, which we're <clears throat> going to talk about, which are a, a compilation of uh, responses to October 7th coming from different perspectives, which I think is the first, the first piece of work like that, certainly in English, maybe in any language. Um, so we're going to talk about that as well. Um, and I'll, I'll hold the conversation with David and then open the floor um, to questions. Okay, so. <clears throat> I need to use my phone for the... Uh, yes, for the recording and for the Zoom, uh, for our Zoom. Um, all right, so first of all, let me formally introduce David. David Hirsch, who, as I said, is the academic director and CEO of the London Centre for the Study of Contemporary Antisemitism. He's also a senior lecturer, lecturer at Goldsmiths, University of London. Um, David has been working on um, a sociological, a pioneer, sorry, a sociological account of contemporary anti-Zionism <laughs> and its relationship to antisemitism. He's worked on crimes against humanity, totalitarianism, democracy, and populism. He teaches core sociology, criminology, crimes against humanity, and human rights 
at both undergraduate mm -hmm. and master's levels. He was central in building uh, the Engage network and website that led opposition to an academic boycott of Israel in the UK from 2004. Uh, he was also a leading critic of the ideas underpinning the Corbyn movement, uh, and he's been instrumental in shaping the democratic and Jewish responses in Britain and further afield to anti-Semitism. Uh, he's appeared as an expert witness in a number of court cases and inquiries. He's written formal reports, and he's chaired a university academic appeals panel on anti-Semitism. So um, they've been doing this for a long time. I should just say on a personal note that um, I, I, I wasn't sure of the year when I checked. It was 2004 that the academic boycott thing started, and that was I, that was 20 years ago when I was a younger man. And, um, and that's when I first came across you, Dave, because I was, I think... I, th I think I was maybe I think I was maybe working at the Israeli embassy in London at the time, and so you were very you were one of the names that was always coming up as as the one of the main um, sort of um, fighters in the in the in that particular in that particular fight. And since then, David and I have, have met on several occasions, um, and he's been he's spoken at our events before as well. So I want to start, David, with a question about um, about the censor. Um, you said it was. Founded just over a year ago. Um, can you tell us what, what, may, what, what? How did that come about? Was it related? How was it related to the what I think in many many respects was the the great crisis for British Jewry, which was the Corbyn the rise to the to the seat of the leader of the opposition of Jeremy Corbyn. I think it was five years. He was he was, in, he was um, a, a a candidate for prime minister effectively um, in Britain. Um, and turn the Labour Party into a hotbed of anti-Semitism. Um, what was the relationship between that and the establishment of the centre? And can you tell us a little about the aims of the centre? Sure. The answer is I'm not sure, actually. Um, we, as you say, have been doing this work <clears throat> since, ah, you say 2004, I would have said 2005, I'm not sure, um, in uh, opposing and resisting the campaign to boycott Israeli universities. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, the what became clear to me, actually, was that you could not understand anti-Zionism and the BDS that comes with anti-Zionism without understanding its uh, relationship to uh, anti-Semitism and to anti-Semitisms that came before it. Mm. Um, so the campaign against the boycott became also a campaign against anti-Semitism. And because I'm an academic, it became a, a, a project to try to understand it, to try to understand contemporary anti-Semitism. Um, we had some, we, we built the Engage Network uh, at that time, and we had some successes. In fact, in the end, we partly succeeded in preventing a boycott from being institutionalized by the academic unions. We kind of forced a stalemate, really. But on the question of anti-Semitism, we lost. Uh, and we could not have lost more clearly, I think. And the final battle at that time in the trade unions, in the academic trade unions, uh, went to court uh, with Ronnie Fraser. And um, the judge did not find for us at all, in fact, the judge repeated the things that were generally said about us in the academic unions. And what was generally said was that we were pretending that we thought there was an issue of anti-Semitism when really all we were trying to do was to silence and delegitimize criticism of Israel, uh, which is a pattern that just recurs and recurs and recurs. So who was the judge at the time? Uh, there were three judges. Um, honestly, I don't even really remember the names. It, it's it, 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 um, that pattern of response. Uh, I called the Livingston formulation after Ken Livingston used it. He was accused of anti-Semitism, and he said, uh, uh, "I am accused of anti-Semitism because I've been critical of the Israeli government." Just for non-British listeners who aren't aware, Ken Livingston was a former mayor of London and a former. Senior figure in the Labour Party who came from the same faction of the Labour Party as Jeremy Corbyn, effectively. Yeah, I mean, it, it, in a sense, it doesn't really matter who he was. He was quite a successful and charismatic figure on the left, um, and he won 
elections in London pretty regularly. And he did not invent this uh, response to uh, an accusation of anti-Semitism. <gasps> and it was not only him. In fact, when he used it, I thought, oh, I've heard this before. And uh, we hear it all the time, that people who raise the issue of anti-Semitism are accused that they're faced with this kind of immediate counter accusation. The counter accusation is that they're not really being honest when they say that they've experienced anti Semitism or when they say that they have uh, understood things to be anti Semitic. Mm. The accusation is that they're not honest, that they are in fact raising it in bad faith in an attempt to try to delegitimize criticism of Israel. And this comes back and back and back again and again. And it is a conspiracy fantasy. So mm -hmm. when, you know, there is supposed to be this ethic that whenever somebody says they have experienced uh, some kind of a hate crime or some kind of racism, one should begin by taking what they say seriously. But with the Livingston formulation, one begins by assuming that they are doing so in bad faith mm -hmm. in order to uh, delegitimize democratic criticism. Yeah. I, 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 rem I remember also it came up a lot in the, in the Corbyn years that the what would happen would be that someone would would be anti-Zionist in a very in a, in a sense of really demonizing Israel, delegitimizing Israel. Israel has no right to exist. And then that would be framed as criticism of Israel. So therefore, what are you talking about? It's not like how can it be anti-Semitic? So, you know, someone would accuse Jeremy Corbyn or one of his uh, acolytes of being anti-Semitic and would cite him saying something along the lines of is the you know, the establishment of the state of Israel was was some crime against humanity or yeah. something along those lines. And then people would say, <laughs> well, that's just criticism. And, and clearly in, in the context of any other country, that would not be deemed just criticism. But in the but in the context of Israel and Zionism it somehow is. There's a double standard also in the in the way that Israel and the Zionism as the, the national movement of Jewish people is is given a different treatment to any other country or national movement. So I'm trying to dredge up from my memory the, the examples of the kinds of things that were being said at that time. Uh, people might remember that there was a, a story about Jeremy Corbyn who had referred to Hamas and Hezbollah as his friends. His friends, yeah. Not mm -hmm. so good. And um, he was challenged on this, you know, famously on Channel 4 News. Why did you call them your friends? And he batted it away quite effectively. And he said, look, I am for uh, negotiations and discussion and I'm for a peace process. And I, it was just diplomatic language. I had these guys in the room and I was being polite, you know. So, but what he didn't do was, as Boaz points out, what he didn't do was, was or what the news, the journalists didn't do, was to point out that he had not only called Hamas and Hezbollah his friends, but he had also gone on to say that they were a, both of them, forces for good and for peace and justice. Peace and justice. I'm trying to remember the specifics. Yeah. Uh, peace and justice across the region. And remember yes. that at the time, Hezbollah was uh, killing people here and there in Syria on behalf of the Iranian regime. So. Corbyn says these, this, these are forces for peace and justice uh, uh, across the Middle East. And generally, if somebody says that an anti-Semitic movement is a force for peace and justice, you'd think that that would mean he supports them. You know, if I was to say in, in the 60s, in, in, in the south of the United States, if I was to say that the Ku Klux Klan is a force for peace and justice across uh, uh, Georgia, then most people would think that that meant that I would support the Ku Klux Klan. I'm worried now because somebody's going to edit this uh, <laughs> video. Um, so clearly Corbyn expressed support for Hamas and Hezbollah. Corbyn had visited, uh, uh, been hosted by Hamas a number of times in Gaza. And so you raise the issue of anti-Semitism. You say, there you go. You support these two anti-Semitic movements. You support them politically and you apologize for them. And then somebody would come back and say, oh, you're just trying to say that Corbyn is anti-Semitic because he's, he's, he makes criticisms of Israel. Yeah. And obviously in that case and in all of the other cases, 
it was actually nothing to do with criticism of Israel. It was criticism of his support for anti-Semitism. Yeah. So uh, to, to finish up, uh, answering your first question, actually. So um, by, so we fought the boycott campaign and in the end, really we lost on anti-Semitism. People were saying, why do you spend your time fighting with these idiots in this idiot union? And the answer was that if we don't, um, it will spread. And we lost, and it yeah. did spread through the trade union movement in Britain, and then through quite odd and unexpected particular circumstances into the Labour Party, into the leadership of the Labour Party. And Corbyn uh, had one election in which he didn't lose by very much, and then a second election in which he did lose by quite a lot. And uh, then the leadership of the Labour Party changed, and the uh, leadership who had supported Corbyn were kind of pushed back out of the structures of the Labour Party and back really onto campus. The movement was pushed back into the universities. We, uh, well, we decided that it was necessary to institutionalise this work because we felt that if we didn't do that, then we might kind of be finished, really, um, as... You know, there are not many academics in Britain who are studying or uh, addressing or challenging anti-Semitism on campus um, professionally. There are quite a few academics who do it kind of in their spare time, right? But they know that they cannot build a, an academic career by doing that, by doing what academics do, which is to research and to write books and to write scholarly papers and to teach. You cannot really make an academic career doing that. So we decided to institutionalize that work um, and to try to, to rebuild the academic community and the academic infrastructure from which we are generally marginalized. Mm. Um, so that's what that's the point of um, the London Center for the Study of Contemporary Antisemitism. Okay, um, there's a, I'm going to quote from the, the mission statement on the Centre's website. It says, it meant, it says on the, the, about the mission of the Centre that it's to challenge the intellectual underpinnings of anti-Semitism in public life and to confront the hostile environment for Jews in universities. So I wanted to ask, what, uh, how do you, what <laughs> are those intellectual underpinnings that you, that you perceive and how can they be seen <clears throat> Tachlis, as they say in this country, in the reaction to October 7th. So it's really interesting, actually, that every organization which opposes anti Semitism or pro Israel organizations, they all look at campuses in Europe uh, and in America and elsewhere and they say there's a real serious problem of anti Semitism. Everybody knows it, everybody can see it but most of them cannot do anything about it. And most of them, when they try, they, uh, they kind of go around the edges of it. I mean, the, you know, amongst the best of them are the Union of Jewish Students, for example, in Britain, who, um, yeah, they're great. They look after Jewish students, they look after the social life of Jewish students, they organize Jewish students politically. But what they don't do and what they can't do is engage with academic uh, work. So let me give you a current example. People will have heard probably uh, a recording of Judith Butler that went around uh, a couple of weeks ago, went around social media. And Judith Butler said, uh, let me just say who- Not everyone knows who she is. Right, so Judith Butler is a very, important social theorist. For some reason. <laughs> That's, there's, my there's my commentary, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Um, she's very important in the sense that she dominates uh, a, a, a serious uh, tradition and a serious current of uh, contemporary philosophy and social theory. In my institution, for example, she is widely loved and admired and quoted and if she would deign to come and speak at my institution, uh, there would be a lot of excitement. 
So she said the other day um, in a very scholarly tone, she said, look, you have to understand that the violence of the 7th of October was, uh, and I'm not quoting, but she said it was counter violence to uh, uh, the real crime, which is Zionism and uh, the occupation of Palestine. It's counter violence. You have to understand that it is a revolutionary response to the violence of Zionism and imperialism. And then she said, in that context, some of it, it's all some of it, <laughs> she said some of it was anguishing to me. Mm. Remember that Judith Butler is the key theorist of gender and gendered violence on the planet, in a sense, right? And she says about an organized campaign of murder and kidnapping and sexual violence. She says it was anguishing to me, some of it, but it was a uh, counter violence of what she has called in the past uh, organizations of the global left. Justified. Now, uh, uh, they crossed a few lines, but otherwise mm -hmm. I understand why they did it, basically. Well, <laughs> I think what she was saying really is that in Birkbeck, where she teaches in Southern, in Northern California. Um, sorry, sorry, Berkeley. Birkbeck is, that was a Freudian slip. Birkbeck is in London. I apologize. Um, uh, in Berkeley, she wants to be in a discussion with the people who, and she complained later, they gave her a really hard time to say some of it was anguishing, right? You know, she really was courageous for, for raising a critique of Hamas's tactic. <laughs> anyway, look, the point is that until we challenge those people who are in leadership positions in the disciplines, who are in the professoriate, who write the books that other people quote and teach and admire, until we challenge that discourse, uh, then everything else we do on campus to oppose anti-Semitism is really around the edges of that. So uh, every organization wants to attack anti-Semitism on campus, but what we want to do is to organize academics to do that as part of our professional work. Uh, and there's an interesting thing here, because whenever I mention the word research, Everybody, especially funders, they kind of roll their eyes and they go to sleep and they and people want to say, we've done enough research. We know what the problem is. We need to act. And the thing is, in academic life, research is action. Mm -hmm. Research means finding the funding for uh, young scholars, for other scholars mm -hmm. to take a year, to take two years, to... Uh, write and research on a topic to write research outputs, which means books and journal articles. And uh, how do you get into a debate with Judith Butler? You have to write a book. And it takes, you know, a lot of time and it's very, very expensive because academics need to be bought out of their work. They need to pay overheads to universities. And in order to change the weather in academia, we need people to uh, be challenging the anti-Semitism that is considered legitimate around them. And just finally on that, that I think there are places and spaces in academia where anti-Semitism is normal. For example, in some of Middle East studies, in the kinds of things that Judith Butler says quite often, uh, there is an anti-Semitic attack on genocide studies, which wants to decenter the Holocaust from genocide studies and to re-establish uh, the uh, really important global violence, which is the violence of imperialism against the imperialized peoples and to decenter uh, the Holocaust, which is a kind of, some people say, a, a little spat between white people in Europe. Seriously. Yeah. So in order to take on this stuff, we have to fund research and we have to produce research outputs and we have to get teaching uh, inside uh, universities, and we have to 
replicate the academic community and infrastructure that can do that. I want, having having decentered the, the Holocaust, I, I wonder which country they would focus on as the main perpetrator of, <laughs> of imperialist <laughs> genocide. Um, yeah. Um, okay. I, I, what I want to, I, I want to talk a little bit about the last six months um, and <clears throat> what's been happening in the UK. Um, many people will have seen similar to that have seen in, in, in pictures from the United States and other places of, of huge demonstrations. Um, I, there was at one point, you can tell me if it's still going on, week, there's a weekly, weekly anti-Israel demonstrations every Saturday in London. Um, what, what's, what, the, what is the character of these? Are they all, you know, because I think, if you look at social media, social media by, by its very nature focuses on the most extreme Situation. So anyone watching this on social media will 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 have, will have seen the you know the really extreme things that are being said you know from the river to the sea, calls for intifada, all this kind of stuff. Is that would you in your experience in your in your understanding is that the norm? Is that dominant? How do you see the the nature of the for one of a better phrase the sort of anti-Israel feeling in is in in the UK right now? Its prevalence. And what if you can, how British Jews are responding to it? So I think that perhaps the most significantly extreme thing that is being said is that Israel is committing genocide and that Israel is engaged in a campaign to murder thousands of children. And the reason that is extreme is because Firstly, it is not true. And we can talk about that at some length. Uh, my PhD was on genocide and on the law against genocide. And although I'm only a sociologist, I know a little bit about that. Um, so firstly, it's not true that Israel is committing genocide. And I think actually the interesting thing about that is that people do not really understand anything at all about war. And people do not understand uh, that there might possibly be a war that one is forced to fight. There might be a just war. People do not understand how a war would be fought. And actually, there is a very clear trope <clears throat> of Jewish power mm. at work here. And it goes like this. If Israel really only wanted to do what it says that it wants to do, which is to... Uh, prevent Hamas from doing this again, it could do that really easily. And it could do that with it basically without killing anybody. Because Israel is so powerful, if it wanted to, it could do that without killing anybody. And therefore, because so many people are killed in the war, it must be because they want to. Because they could do it without killing anybody. So there is a, a kind of really serious naivety about what war is and how it happens and how it is carried out. And actually, partly that is an inability of, of people, for example, on campus, to imagine themselves fighting in a just war against people who want to kill them or to enslave them. Because once you imagine that that is even a possibility, then you start thinking about, well, what kind of tactics would we use to, to keep us as safe as we can be kept? And then, you know, people who understand anything about urban warfare already understand that um, it is not something that can be done uh, without hurting anybody. So that's the first thing. The genocide accusation is not true. But secondly, it, of course, resonates with both Jewish history and with the history of anti-Semitism. Um, genocide was codified as a crime after the Holocaust. And the accusation of absolute <laughs> evil and of being so evil that one wanted to murder children 
for no reason, just out of malice. Um, that is an old accusation that has been at the heart of anti-Semitism, actually at the heart of many different manifestations of anti-Semitism over the centuries in different times and different places. The <clears throat> accusation is that uh, Jews, in order to reenact the uh, crime of absolute evil, which was to murder thank you, Jesus, um, in order to reenact that, uh, the Jews murder innocent uh, non-Jewish children. And it has happened often that when a child has been murdered, has gone missing, then people have not known who had done it. And there is a temptation to blame the Jews because the Jews are capable of such things. And there is a Christian tradition of portraying Jews as being inhumanly evil. And not only uh, rejecting and murdering Jesus, which, which kind of prevents their own um, uh, redemption, but it prevents everybody's redemption. So the Jews, with their evil and their murder of God, screws it up for all of us. The Jews sit between us and utopia. And most anti-Semitism that have happened since that Christian tradition of anti-Semitism have bought into that. There is a some kind of conspiracy fantasy that there is something going on that is evil, that threatens us. <laughs> there's communism or there's capitalism or there's nationalism or there's uh, anti-nationalism, something awful that seems to be organized that makes me feel threatened and who is behind it. And it is just so tempting to borrow this face of evil that sits there in the cultural unconscious, which is the face of the Jew. People will remember 1984, the novel by George Orwell. And I think Orwell understood this really clearly, that every day in a workplace in this dystopian future, people have two minutes hate. And they go to a telly screen together and they hate this face. And the face is the counter-revolutionary, the man who is behind all the troubles, the, the, all, everything that prevents Big Brother from making us all happy, and his name is Goldstein. <laughs> and all I understood that the face of the Jew is so tempting by totalitarian politics to be raised as uh, uh, the... It's, it's tempting because actually the conspiracy can't be seen and it can't be felt and really touched but if you give it a human face, then it gives a kind of emotional way of focusing your hatred and your anger. So lots of anti-Semitism operates in that way. And if you say Israel is now committing genocide, Israel is now doing what the Nazis did, and Israel is now not only killing the odd child here and there, but systematically murdering thousands of children, then uh, again, you are making Israel into the face of all evil. And one sees this quite often appearing in the rhetoric. There was somebody, uh, another kind of speech that went around from a campus in the United States of America, where somebody said the greatest blow that could be made against capitalism would be the defeat of Zionism and the defeat of Israel. Um, or people like Stephen Salater, who was an academic, who was very cross because he didn't get tenure, uh, said that um, Zionism is, uh, I can't remember the quote, but people use Zionism as a, as a kind of symbol of everything bad in the world. So, uh, genocide. Firstly, it's not true. Secondly, it makes Jews into Nazis. And thirdly, it... Uh, resonates with the history of anti-Semitism and the Jews as the face of evil. Now, that isn't something that is done by a few weirdos on Twitter. That is something that is now respectable in academia and in public discourse in Britain and in Europe and in America and actually across the world. So um, there was a day a couple of months ago <coughs> when anti-Semitism was at the top of the news agenda in Britain, 
and uh, it was discussed on the Today program, like, you know, the flagship Radio 4 program, and it was on the front page of the Times and the Express. And I thought to myself, well, OK, that's quite encouraging. Anti-Semitism at the top of the news agenda. What am I worried about? And I thought about it. And then I realised that what's going on here is that every other day at the top of the news agenda is various ways of accusing Israel of genocide. And then on this day, the Today programme is saying, my gosh, there's anti-Semitism. Where does it come from? How does it exist in, in civilised Britain? And they do not realise that the discourse that they have been legitimising, you know, the BBC is balanced. So it balances between anti-Semitism and opponents of anti-Semitism. When they have an anti-Semite, they also have a Jew. When, you know, the BBC is... They is, have as a Jew. Sometimes they have an as a Jew. So, um, but when they talk about anti-Semitism, what they did not understand and they did not even investigate was their own complicity with making the very tropes of anti-Semitism acceptable and normal. And I work with people uh, in my university who are quite happy to sign statements saying that... Uh, Israel commits genocide, murders children, the uh, Society of uh, People Who Study Childhood put out a statement, uh, and you think, well, hang on, why? What, is, what are people who specialise in childhood studies got to do with this? It's not as if they know anything particular about the Gaza war, and we don't need people who specialise in childhood studies to tell us that murdering children is bad, right? It's just the fact that they are students of childhood studies, which is the headline. And the headline is, scholars of, of childhood studies uh, denounce Israel's child murder. Yeah, so it's, it's this, um, it's, there's, it's like, there's like a, this snowballing effect going on. Of, uh, it, it's just, ga it's gathering, it's gathering steam, it's gathering pace and there is a, um, as you said, sort of complete lack of understanding on the part of um, maybe not necessarily bad actors, but just people either too lazy or too, um, I know, chasing the next headline to actually put two and two together and, and make this connection between the reporting on Israel and the way Israel is demonized and the rise in anti-Semitism. But I, I want to get, I want to get back to the um so the the, uh, the feeling that this is that this is that this is creating for Britain's Jewish population. So I know both from things I've read and also because I have family in the UK, friends and family, that you know there are that they, they won't go into central London on a on a Saturday when this rally is taking place because certainly if they're religious and wear a kippah and they're obviously Jewish, but even if they're not, they might be just scared that mm. somehow they're going to be targeted. Is that do, do, what is that something you've either either personally experienced or that, you, or that you know is a is a feeling that's that's current in the in the community? So it's a it's an interesting question to me because everybody after the, October the seventh, they said this is a watershed moment. This mm -hmm. is something new. Um, this changes the world, and I wasn't sure. And I sat down and I tried to think about why that might be true or on what basis. And I thought, you know, in 1967 and 1973, uh, it was not Toyota pickup trucks, but it was, uh, uh, you know, British and Russian uh, supplied armies of the whole Arab League of five Arab states that seemed to have a pretty decent chance of defeating Israel. And we always said that uh, if Israel was defeated, then many, many people would be killed. And there was plenty of rhetoric uh, uh, to back that up. So, so how was this new? And we had seen uh, airplanes being hijacked and you know the bombing of uh, uh, the Jewish community center in uh, Buenos Aires. Uh, many, many, uh, uh, imagine the murder of the Israeli Olympic team in 1972. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had uh, the communist countries 
pushing anti-Semitism in the international organizations, and they had state power over a third of the earth. So, so I'm thinking, okay, so October the 7th, is it unique? Is it new? And now, actually, now I'm persuading myself that, that it's not. But it, it did have very serious effects. So Danny Trom is a sociologist um, in Paris, very smart guy, very interesting guy. Um, he said the interesting thing about October the 7th was that Israelis in the south of the country called for help and there was no help. They were experiencing, uh, some people have talked about pogroms or, or a genocidal attack. And they, you know, literally got on the phone and called the police, called the, for, for help, called the army, and there was no help. Called the media too. And um, Danny says this brought those Israelis, and by extension Israelis in general, back to a very mm. Jewish diasporic experience of being alone, of calling for help and not getting help. And then uh, Anthony Julius, actually, and the, these people have both written uh, pieces in this uh, forthcoming uh, trilogy, which I will talk about in a Anthony Julius then said, what's new? What's new after October 7th? And he said in Britain, one of the things that's new is a, a decrease in faith that British Jews have in the institutions of British democracy. And what he meant was, I think, the BBC, the universities, the Metropolitan <laughs> Police, who policed the big demonstrations, the Crown Prosecution Service, uh, a whole kind of set of institutions that Jews had had quite a lot of faith in, actually, began to look shaky. The schools, a lot of Jews, since, since when I was a kid, I don't know the figures, but when I was a kid, almost no Jewish kids went to Jewish schools. Some did, but not many. And now I think it's well over half of Jewish kids go to Jewish schools. And there are complicated reasons for that. But one of the reasons is that they have been pushed out. So, so this feeling of calling for help and there being no help, and this feeling of calling on the institutions of the British state and the French state and the American state and help looking like it was not so reliable anymore. And uh, this feeling of precarity. And then also not only did Israelis have a reminder of the diasporic experience, but the diaspora got a reminder of the Israeli experience, which is that of being denounced. Mm. Um, and it's so interesting because, because the experience of anti-Semitism is, is an experience of being in a place where you think you are at home. In my case, in a sociology department, I can tell you, I was so proud to be in a top sociology department back in 2003 when I got a job. So proud of myself. And I remember sitting in departmental meetings and looking around the room and thinking, wow, I'm one of these guys now. I'm, you know. And then suddenly when the boycott turned up, and I made arguments against the boycott and against anti-Semitism. Suddenly, I wasn't a sociologist anymore. I wasn't one of these people anymore. But now I was a Zionist sociologist. <laughs> and what that meant was a dishonest, lying sociologist, a person who uses all of his clever Jewish you know, tricks and, and all of the clever rhetorics of sociology in order to help genocide. So I, I was kind of basically cast out of the community of the good, out of the community of sociologists. And this was not just me, I realized. You know, Luciana Berger, for example, uh, gave an interview to the Times. A uh, former Labour MP that was forced out of the party during the Corbyn years. And she said, uh, that the, <laughs> on the, the headline in the Times was, uh, uh, called her a, a Jewish Labour MP. She said, I never wanted to be a Jewish Labour MP. I wanted to be a Labour MP. And Howard Jacobson is a novelist. And he never wanted to be a Jewish novelist, he wanted to be a novelist. And this process, and, and I, I mean, this is a book I so much want to write, actually, the book about how the experience of anti-Semitism pushes people out of the places where they thought they were at home. 
uh, uh, you know, I heard a story. I met a woman once, and I wish I was in touch with her. She told me, and she was born, in fact, in Wales in during the war. And the reason for that was because her daddy was a Czech fighter pilot, a hero, a hero in the Second World War. He he took his plane from Czechoslovakia to Britain, and he fought the war uh, with the RAF. And in 1945, he went back to Czechoslovakia, and he was a socialist. And he said, I want to build the communist Czechoslovakia. And of course, as people know, within, what, six or seven years, uh, the general secretary of the Czechoslovakian Communist Party, uh, Slansky, and 11 of his uh, colleagues, who happened all but one to be Jewish, were hanged. And Slansky was accused at his trial of bourgeois Jewish nationalism and Zionism, and uh, they were all hanged. And this woman's father was sent to the uranium mines and came out 11 years later with lung cancer. And it's that he thought he belonged. He went back to Czechoslovakia because he thought he belonged, and then he found that he didn't belong. The feminists in the Spare Rib Collective in 1982 in London thought they belonged. And then they were challenged to denounce the uh, Israeli invasion of Lebanon. They were held responsible for it. They were pushed out of the Spare Rib Collective out of their feminist universe. And to write a book about all of these stories, I think, would be great. And now one sees it happening to other people. Somebody comes to you and says, I joined the Labour Party in 2015 because I loved Corbyn. And you think, really? <laughs> Why? <laughs> but that's the wrong question, because the right question is they thought they were at home in a socialist party. And then they discovered they were not. And then they come to us and they say, you know, thank goodness I read your book because it made me feel not mad anymore. <laughs> um, so uh, that is the mechanism of, of being marginalised. And it, it's back to the Livingston formulation. Mm. If you say, I experienced anti-Semitism, people are supposed to take that seriously. They're supposed to listen to you and listen to your reasons and your evidence and see what you say and see how you feel, but they don't. All they say is, ah, we know what you're up to. So it's that same um, exclusion of Jews from the normal life of humanity. And, and it's, it's really interesting when you, when you, when you frame a sentence in that way, because it also brings home to me the relationship between the Zionism and anti-Semitism because, because, because of Israel, because it's all about making Israel mm. the Jew among the nations, right? It's all about making Israel the country that shouldn't feel at home among other nations, that is excluded from UN uh, commissions, that is uh, you know, made to feel like it is, mm. it, is, it is different from other countries, that it is worse than other countries, that it is somehow, even though it flies in the face of all facts, the great human rights uh, abuser among all the nations of the world. And that, I think, is, is it, it speaks to exactly what you're talking about. Um, before we go to audience questions, which we're, we're just about to do, I want to just quickly give you an opportunity to plug your the, 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 the books that your centre is producing. So um, I know there was one recently, The Rebirth of Anti-Semitism, um, but also, as I said at the beginning, there's a book that's published, I think, in June this year, which I think is really interesting and exciting because the first of its kind is an anthology a three-part anthology of responses to October 7th. Mm. Um, I've just got it uh, here. One is called Anti-Semitic Discourse, <clears> one <throat> is Law and Society, and one is Universities. Can you just tell us a little bit about the, just the, the kind of uh, <clears throat> process of putting that together? And what so, as I said, the, the London Centre for the Study of Contemporary Anti-Semitism <laughs> wants to recreate the academic community and the academic infrastructure from which we feel we are excluded. Um, and part of that is uh, places to publish. And actually this book series in general was just a brilliant kind of piece of, of I don't know, of luck or goodwill or the guy at Rowledge who published my 2018 book on anti-Semitism, I emailed him and I said, can we, can we publish a series for, from the center? And he said, yeah. <laughs> and, and we said, brilliant, we'll do that then. 
So suddenly we have a way of publishing academic books on anti-Semitism. And that's not easy to do, right? Because if you go to any publisher and you say, I'd like you to publish my book, please. They'll say, okay, let's have a look. Oh, I'm not sure. They'll send it out to peer review. Mm. And, uh, you know, one peer reviewer will say, this is brilliant. This should be published immediately. And one will say, oh, I'm not sure. And the other will say, oh, this is a propaganda for genocide. It's not ac academic research at all. And then the company will say, oh, yeah, we'll give it this one a pass, please. Um, so we are able to, we have a trusted relationship with Ramage. Uh, we, if a book is of the right quality, we're able to publish it. The first one we published was by Matthias Kunzel, which, which is actually the most controversial uh, because Matthias uh, writes, um, he, he, his book really is a bringing together of the evidence that he's spent most of his career pulling together about the relationship between Nazism and Nazi anti-Semitism and uh, anti-Semitism in the Middle East, um, which is a topic that is really not discussed because it is much too scary. Um, because you might offend Muslims. You might, yes. Uh, how very dare you say that, you know. The second book is great. Is I don't know if people know Alan Johnson and Fathom. Mm -hmm. uh, Fathom is a... a, a a journal that has come out regularly for 10 years. It's really good. Mm -hmm. um, it brings uh, articles um, on not only on anti-Semitism, but also on Israel and the Middle East. And uh, it is a place to publish. And the idea of it was simply to inform the debate about Israel and the Middle East. Mm -hmm. um, and Alan has brought together a lot of the work uh, that has been published in Fathom with a lot of new work, uh, interview with uh, Philip Spencer and the piece by Dave Rich. And that's the second book that we published. The third book we published uh, was my uh, anthology, which is called The Rebirth of Antisemitism in the 21st Century. So the 21st century starts, I mean, we thought, one would have thought really, that at the end of the 20th century, anti-Semitism was really on its last legs after Why? the Holocaust. Um, uh, and the growth of uh, democratic states, anti-Semitism was not very sexy. It was kind of uh, represented by some of the vestiges of the far right. At the beginning of the 21st century, one had three uh, symbolic events, actually. One was the end of the peace process. Um, one was the Durban Conf World Conference Against Racism, where there was a very concerted and organized campaign to reconstitute Israel as the symbolic uh, center of racism across the world. I mean, astonishing that Zionism should be the symbolic racism across the world. Astonishing that people in America should say that uh, the police in Minnesota required the Israelis to teach them how to murder <laughs> A black American, astonishing, but that is how the discourse goes. Um, and the third event, only a week after the Durban conference was 9-11. So that was 2001. <laughs> and uh, uh, this is the book, really. It's a 20th anniversary book of the academic boycott campaign. And it is written by 11 different scholars. Uh, one of them is sitting at the back, Isabella Tavarovsky, who is actually one of the world's foremost writers on Soviet anti-Zionism and its relationship to uh, contemporary anti-Semitism. Um, and different people who had been involved in the fight against the ethnic boycott were now writing with 20 years of hindsight um, what they had learned from that. And the fourth book uh, in the series, which is already published is by Jeffrey Herr, who has had a brilliant career. Uh, he's an academic at the University of Maryland, and uh, uh, he's published his book on uh, the three faces of anti-Semitism, uh, left anti-Semitism, right anti-Semitism, and Islamist anti-Semitism. And the, the latest book that we spent all of our holidays over the winter, the Christmas holidays, bringing together, we put out a public call for contributions from scholars and intellectuals with their immediate, fresh, thoughts on the 7th of October. And uh, we had a really good response. Um, Routledge said to publish a book very quickly, you have to limit it to 50,000 words in this particular format. 
And we said, can we go higher? They said, no. They said, well, you can publish a second one. So we said, all right, we'll publish two. And in the end, we had three books. And I'm pretty sure it is the biggest and most serious um, collection of scholarly and intellectual responses to the significance of the 7th of October and the uh, events that followed it. Um, so people can look on our website for that. The, the uh, series by Routledge is called Studies in Contemporary Antisemitism. And the website is, the website is, Lond is it London Antisemitism? So our website is londonantisemitism.com. Uh, and yeah, there is a link from there. I mean, the other major publishing platform really that we are nurturing is the Journal of Contemporary Antisemitism. Uh, we're doing lots of other things too, but... Um, very good. That's fantastic. Uh, just a little plug of my own. We, Jeffrey Herfey, you mentioned, is actually appearing on a webinar that I'm doing in, in about a month. So we'll talk about that. Um, okay. Um, let's. Okay. <laughs> if, so you need to give me a chance to say, let's have let's have a question. I'm going to go on. Thanks, Paul. Hi. It's fascinating what you're saying, and it's also great to hear it. But what I'm thinking to myself is, who's going to be reading these books? Not anti Semites, these books that you're, you're publishing. What frustrate? what I think really frustrates me and probably everyone else <coughs> is the fact that there just isn't the narrative out there in enough force to be able to communicate with ordinary people who aren't necessarily particularly anti Semitic, but they're being drowned by the news and drowned by the fact that the Palestinians have, and Muslims in Britain, Europe, France, Germany, America have got the narrative. So even I know amongst my own family members, they're constantly being bombarded with this. And it's, it's actually sometimes really difficult for me to be able to put mm. our side of the narrative. Mm. I listen to Douglas Murray, I listen to mm. the son of Hamas, and I listen to Richard Kemp. And I think, why aren't there more of us? I mean, we're all supposed to be so smart. This is what son of Hamas says. You know, we're lovely people. We're smart. We're creative. Why aren't we putting this narrative out there? I just cannot understand how this has happened. We've got plenty of capable people in the UK here. Yeah. And yet what happens is we end up talking amongst ourselves, which she is very, very useful. Don't, don't <laughs> understand me. But this is the thing, because I think there are people that would listen, but we're just not getting it out there. OK, so your, so your question That's is... My question is, how can we get it out there? Okay. What do we do? Right, so, so just, I just want to just boil it down for, for any people on Zoom that might not have heard the question is that the, the, it's fantastic what David's doing, but her, the latest concern is that it might not be read by the right people, and that how do we challenge the narrative that's the overwhelming narrative that's us? So the polling, as far as I understand it at the moment, is um, is not quite that right. The polling is interesting. I think something like a quarter of people in Britain hold. Uh, pretty clearly anti-Semitic views. You know, Israel commits genocide, Israel is like the Nazis, etc. cetera. Mm. About a quarter have very clearly uh, uh, views which are not anti-Semitic, which understand and which challenge anti-Semitism. <laughs> and about two quarters in the middle uh, either don't know or don't care or haven't heard about it or don't want to say. So uh, in a sense, um, the 25% of people who, who embrace anti-Semitism are really in themselves a worry, right? In a sense, that's enough, right? When we were fighting the boycott campaign, they quite like to be a radical minority. They don't necessarily need a majority yeah. at all. Um, and the, the answer to the question is, who are we talking to? We're not talking to the anti-Semites. We're not trying to persuade anti-Semites. We are trying to talk to the people who might be influenced by them. So in the case of Judith Butler, we're talking to people who are studying social theory and who, if they do not have a critique or a challenge or an alternative, will gravitate towards what is considered to be authoritative. So I, I think it's really important uh, that we um, address in a rational manner with evidence uh, uh, the anti-Semitic narrative. Now, obviously, people don't embrace anti-Semitism for reasons. Anti-Semitism is, uh, is irrational. <laughs> so one can't defeat anti-Semitism by making rational arguments. By making rational arguments, 
is a really important part of defeating anti-Semitism. And the part that we play, as I said, is, is we have a particular focus on the kind of highest level academic discourse. There are other people who are really good at talking to much wider publics. Uh, I'm not. Um, so in a sense, there are different kinds of jobs to be done. And I think ours is centrally important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Greer. Um, we just heard about the need to change the narrative. Um, why can't we get together some pro-Israel, pro-Jewish writers to write um, in first person Jesus um, in modern contemporary English saying, hey guys, don't you realize I was Jewish? It wasn't a Jew who <laughs> killed me. A Jew may have betrayed me, but the Romans killed me. I mean, people get really uptight about things like that. I have told many Christians that Jesus was Jewish. They didn't know. Apparently, they didn't read their Bibles. Yeah. I don't know. But I think that um, if this was brought out more, that Jesus was doing it was Jewish, and uh, anti-Semites are doing a disservice in his name, and he's really angry, it would create a hell of a lot of attention. <laughs> <laughs> I think quickly, I think firstly, there are many, many very, very talented writers who write against anti-Semitism and who write uh, all kinds of things, good things about Israel or good things about Jews. There are many of them and many of them are brilliant. Uh, so it happens. Um, Secondly, I don't think in the end we're going to defeat anti-Semitism by saying, you know what, Jews are really nice, really. <laughs> right? Anti-Semitism is not rational. And we don't have to say Israel is really nice and we don't have to say Jews are really nice. We just have to say, actually, we have rights. Leave us alone. Stop lying about us. We don't want to be part of your discourse. Talk about something else. And I kind of have a... A, a quite emotional response to people who suggest to me that uh, we have to kind of show ourselves to be really lovely and cool to the rest of the world. No. Okay. Um, gentlemen here. Um, my father said to me about a year ago, there's no future for his grandchildren in England. What's your opinion on that? Okay, the question was, is there a future for, for Jews in England? So during the Corbyn crisis, people were coming to me and saying, oh, you're the expert, you're the big guy, you're the expert on anti-Semitism. How will we know when it's time to leave, right? <laughs> and, you know, in a sense, British Jews are mainly descended from people who knew when it was time to leave. Uh, my granddad just about managed it, actually, 1938. Um, I, I am scandalised that British Jews were coming to me and asking that question. I'm scandalized that there's even a question that, it, that Britain is not uh, safe and hospitable for Jews. Um, and I always said that, no, <laughs> that's not the case at the moment. But people were, people were not leaving, and I think they would not have left. It's an interesting question, what would have happened if Corbyn had won the election? Mm. But what people were doing were making sure they had other options, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. They were making sure they had things to do with their savings or they had perhaps jobs they might go to or they had passports. I've got my German citizenship in my pocket, uh, which I got recently at the time of Brexit and the time of Corbyn. I um, the irony is. In, yeah. Indeed. Um, so just the question scandalizes me, actually. And, and by the way... Uh, who knows? You know, I don't know if I'm going to be turning up on my cousin's doorstep with suitcases or if my Israeli cousins are going to be turning up on our doorstep with suitcases. Who knows what might happen? But just the questions are themselves very disquieting, I think. OK, uh, from this side, Jeff. Uh, David, I'm, I'm wondering if you could possibly talk about uh, the influence of foreign funding on UK campuses. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the United States, it's some of the most elite campuses. Uh, countries like Qatar, uh, China, Saudi Arabia are endowing chairs. 
and uh, funding research and have had a profound impact. Is that happening on UK campuses? And if so, what can be done about it? Is the question is that there are impacts of foreign funding on, on British campuses? So I think my answer to that is to say, like, I haven't made a study of the money. I know that plenty of people are very excited about, you know, following the money and, and, and that kind of work. The first thing I would say is that if anti-Semitism was not interesting to people, it wouldn't matter how much money you put into British campuses because nobody would be interested, right? So if Qatar or, or anyone else are giving a leg up to anti-Semitic rhetoric or anti-Semitic work or anti-Semitic individuals, uh, it's concerning because it resonates. So I, I don't want us to get caught up in any kind of a conspiracy fantasy where we say uh, the Brits are being taken over by foreign money. It's not foreign money. The Corbyn movement was really mainly a British movement, a white, British, non-Jewish movement, well, also a Jewish movement, actually. Yeah. So I don't want to get too caught up in, in blaming uh, funders I mean, there's another story about funding, which is that for generations, maybe four generations now in America, in Israel, in Britain too, uh, Jews who had done well uh, were donating money to universities, to Jewish studies programs, mm -hmm. just because they just assumed that Jewish studies and Israel studies would be good for the Jews. And that money has under the principle of academic autonomy, much of that money is now in the hands of people who are pushing anti-Semitic mm -hmm. intellectual yeah. frameworks. Yeah. And for me, that's really a scandal that, uh, you know, Jewish philanthropists, that there was a story uh, uh, about a philanthropist in uh, the Pacific Northwest in Seattle, who had, I believe, given 5,000 like million dollars to the Jewish studies program at uh, the University of Washington. And she discovered that the endowed chair for whom she, that, that, that department was funding uh, had signed one of these statements, uh, which she believed, and I think she was right, to be fundamentally anti-Semitic. And she pulled her $5 million. And uh, there was a scandal. I mean, the, the, the Jewish studies academics, even some of the ones one would hope would be decent, were how dare these funders try to tell us what to think. Um, uh, so, you know, I want to avoid uh, a story of, because of course people do it with Jewish money too, you know, the Jews buy this and that and the other. Ideas cannot that easily be bought, I think, although it kind of helps and, uh, you know, we would like some funding to do the research that we need, <laughs> that we need to do. And uh, if any people are thinking of giving money to uh, that would be good for the Jews, they should be very careful who they donated to and how it will be controlled. I, I also think you might correct me if I'm wrong. I think that <coughs> although China is very active in funding um, departments in, in Britain, I, don't, I think the, the, the phenomenon of, of Middle Eastern countries like Qatar Funding is much less the case in the UK than in the United States. I believe that. I think that's a true. Um, OK, yes, yeah, so. Yeah, um, firstly, I'm, as an ex second field worker for UJS from the 1970s, I've been a follower of yours and a lot of the other people here uh, um, for what you've written. And what you've done is phenomenal. It's, it's just fantastic. Um, my question would be, and I'm not an academic, what help can the Israeli universities give mm. in dealing with these issues from an academic level? Because, you know, you've said other people, for example, I think that uh, what David Badiel did with uh, um, uh, Jews, Jews Don't count. count had a phenomenal effect, obviously, outside academia, even though it showed exactly what was going on inside academia. But uh, if I speak to my son-in-law or other people who are uh, academics, is there anything that can be done from the universities here to help what's going on in the UK or the US or, or wherever? So the question was, if, is there anything that Israeli universities can do to assist this, this uh, 
this campaign to combat mm -hmm. the Zionism. So, so there are some really good people in Israeli universities. Um, I'm going up to Haifa next week uh, to um, uh, do some work with uh, some of them. Um, Israeli universities are not without their own problem. Oh, um, and in a sense, uh, the last thing Israelis want to be are, uh, the last thing Israeli academics want to be are Israeli academics. They want to be academics, mm -hmm. right? Just as Luciana wanted to be a, a Labour MP and uh, Howard Jacobson wanted to be a, an author. And so Jewish studies scholars and Israeli scholars do not want to be put into the dock to answer for the crimes of Israel, real or imagined or invented or exaggerated. They want to be philosophers and scientists and uh, they know that their careers are at risk if they become known as, you know, kind of uh, Hasbara merchants, that kind of slur. So one shouldn't assume that Israelis um, and Israel, Israeli campuses are, are completely um, brilliant on all, all of this stuff. And of course, also um, in terms of anti-Zionism, of course, anti-Zionism focuses against Israel, but Israelis don't much have that experience of being excluded from the place where they feel at home. And lots of Israelis sure. actually grow up with an experience of being exasperated by the Israeli government um, in, in, in different ways ways so so firstly we shouldn't assume that israelis know you know the truth by magic any any more than anybody else knows the truth by magic um but uh i think for i mean it's interesting for example israelis in london i often get got the feeling that they were very happy to be away from israel they got away from all this craziness and the politics and they just wanted to be regular people and some of them were not all that uh, supportive of our work and mm -hmm. When they talked to, you know, they thought they knew it all about anti-Zionism and they would say, oh, let me tell you about Israel. <laughs> and a lot of them had a shock yeah. after the 7th of October because a lot of Israelis in London, and there were a lot of Israelis in London, suddenly felt targeted, suddenly <laughs> understood a little bit about what we had been talking about for some time. So um, I guess that was all a bit throat-clearing, really. Uh, Israeli universities should do what all universities should do, which is create spaces for research, which challenges the underpinnings of anti-Semitism. Um, and we will be very happy and are very happy to work with um, Israeli scholars. So just as a, just out of interest, what's the, is there a particular program at Haifa University that you're going to be working? Um, I'm uh, speaking at a conference on Tuesday, which is uh, organized by the, I think the Ruderman Foundation. Ruderman Foundation. And I'm doing some work with um, the uh, Compass Center at the University of Haifa and David Barak and uh, Bash Berkowitz and Sarah Herschel and, and other, other wow. people up there, um, which I'm very excited about. Great, great. Um, yes. Um, I think that um, Israeli scholars and Israeli academics should be more open to the Israeli world file. But I'm afraid that um, what we're being confronted with is some very, very urgent. And I think that um, the results that you'd like to get, we'd all like to see, is, is way down the road. So, and since I've come to the Dayton Center all the time, a few weeks ago, um, it was a seminar on social media mm -hmm. and anti-Semitism. And I'm wondering how we can incorporate the um, instantaneous uh, character of social media with the academic world. Is there a way to integrate them both so that we can get this message out immediately mm -hmm. and using the proper algorithms mm -hmm. and the proper um, yeah. Voice. Uh, just the questions about whether whether the the, the instant the instant world mm. of social media can somehow be incorporated into the more academic campaign that David is. Yeah. Is so you. It's so urgent. It's yeah. So, urgent. so you're right. Uh, what I'm promising, um, and really consciously so, is uh, uh, I'm promising that it will be hugely expensive to fund academics to spend years doing research and building academic careers and, and instituting programs of teaching. And uh, it is a very difficult and long-term uh, <coughs> proposal that I'm giving. And I perfectly understand if people go, we haven't got time to do that. But, uh, so two things about that. Um, one is that uh, there is, for example, a lot of research going on about how anti-Semitism and other conspiracy fantasies spread online. Um, 
very important stuff using the most uh, advanced uh, techniques of machine learning and AI and all of that stuff. And there's some really important research so that we understand how those things work and we understand the algorithms better. Um, secondly, I would certainly say that we do work hard to play our part. So, you know, when there is a kind of, uh, uh, we know that when there's conflict in the Middle East, conflict between, with, involving Israel, then anti-Semitism and anti-Semitic discourse spikes in Britain and America and Europe. And part of what we do is we engage on social media and in journalism and, you know, on Twitter and Facebook, and we should do more of that. I mean, I, uh, I remember doing a, a Twitter thread about apartheid, why it's wrong to say that Israel is apartheid. And I gave a whole load of links and, and, and it, it flew, you know, it got a lot of uh, attention and a lot of, and I was very proud of that because partly because sometimes that stuff can only be done by people who, who are kind of professional thinkers, who remember the anti-apartheid movement and were part of it and who have thought about it ever since. So uh, it's not fair to say that we don't do that stuff. Um, but, and, and yes, I also say, as I said earlier on, there are other people who are kind of experts in, in affecting public opinion and winning political <coughs> debates amongst the electorate, and I'm not one of them. Um, so uh, all good wishes to them and uh, to the lawyers. I'm very happy to see Mark uh, Lewis here, who famously said that he can't change the minds of anti-Semitism, but he can take some of their houses off them. Um, Mark is there for us if we get uh, uh, threatened by uh, uh, legal processes. Um, so there are many, many different ways of uh, addressing anti-Semitism, but to what we're doing is not firefighting. We are trying to address the one of the kind of hearts of the fire. Very good. Okay, Barbara. Um, I. I really respect what you're doing. I lived in the UK for 16 years, so I'm I'm familiar with the undercurrent of anti-Semitism, which has is often is often repressed or depressed, <clears throat> and that it has been given license to explode. But it seems to me that there is a connection that you're not mentioning, and I'd like you to maybe address it between what's happening on the streets with the Muslim population and the rampant anti-Semitism. And I'm thinking that the average English person seeing these mobs of insanely angry um, Arabs on their streets think if only the Jews would go away, everything would come back and be normal in England again. And you know the Prime Minister of England is saying that he is afraid that England is turning into mob rule. So this is all about the Muslims. What is the connection? <coughs> and is there not a way to deal directly instead of just coming from 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 an acad? I, I appreciate you're an academic, but there's something really happening on the streets. Right. So the, talk to, talk about the, that. The question was was specifically about the what's happening with with Muslims in Britain and how yes, that's affecting and how it's affecting the anti-Semitism. How it's yeah. affecting the right. So what we don't do is to take political issues and make them into religious issues <coughs> or political issues and make them into racial issues. Anti-Semitism is about bad politics. And it is true that there is some very bad Islamist politics about. There are people who take uh, elements of, is the, of various Islamic traditions and they build out of it uh, totalitarian ideas and totalitarian movements. But the problem there is not the Muslims. The problem is the politics that some people are trying to sow amongst Muslims. And I think it's very important. I think it's true that there are significant anti-Semitic attitudes amongst Muslims. And I think that is really worrying. I also think 
I am really worried by these significant and growing anti-Semitic attitudes amongst young Brits. I think the Corbyn movement was not based or founded on Muslims, but actually on a left tradition and actually a Stalinist tradition. So the last thing that we want to do is to say the real problem in London are these, you know, mobs of, of Muslims making our life miserable, partly because there are some brilliant liberal democratic movements amongst Muslims and to denounce Muslims in general would be to leave those Muslims completely unsupported in the struggle against anti-Semitism and against totalitarian politics. So that's why I think it's really important to focus on politics and not on race and not on religion. And the Islamist claim that the authentic uh, expression of Islam is terroristic and anti-Semitic is not a claim that is borne out by uh, much of the Muslim theology that I have seen and that people have done. And it's not a claim either that is borne out sociologically by looking at the different traditions of Islam that have existed in different places and different times in the world. So I think we have to focus very clearly on politics and on intellectual frameworks and not on religion or on race. Okay, uh, gentlemen. Yes. yes. Simple question. Human rights organization and the possession of apartheid comes from human rights organization. It twisted critique from you know, when it comes with the title, title of authority of the human rights activists, organization, <clears throat> etc. Yeah. This, so, this is about the, the, the accusations of apartheid and, and from human rights organizations, yes. It's not just that. The, the, <laughs> that's the, the, the top of it, but a, a great deal of the misguided critic or the twisted critic or the malevolent critics comes from human rights organizations. Right. Human rights watch. Like human rights watch, and Amnesty International, and in others. Yes, the, the role the role of human rights organisations in the in the de effectively the demonisation. Okay. 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 Mm -hmm. So um, I mentioned earlier on the uh, Durban World Conference Against Racism and the end of the peace process, and I think uh, my memory and my experience of actually the late eighties and the nineties is one when many many people the broad liberal left, if there is such a thing, uh, supported the peace process. They didn't say Israel was an evil that needs to be wiped out. They said we should have a deal between the Israelis and the Palestinians and there will be one, we hope, and it will happen and it will improve the situation. Um, at the Towards the end of the peace process, when it collapsed, when it finally collapsed and when it went into the Durban conference, uh, the discourse was challenged in, in a very significant way. And the challenges to the discourse at Durban came from a number of different directions. And there were people who had never supported the peace process, who had never um, uh, uh, had any kind of hopes in it, and it's interesting that if you look at Durban, you can see uh, the, the anti-Zionist discourse feeding into that from a number of different directions. One is the human rights discourse, uh, particularly in the UN, um, and the uh, people who were busy through, through from the, the mid-70s when the UN's position was Zionism equals racism, until the late 80s when everybody changed their position and said we for the peace process, but the old 70s discourse of Zionism equals racism was brought back after the collapse of the peace process into the Durban conference and was then disseminated around the world. It came through the NGOs, it came through human rights discourse, it came through the UN women's conferences, it came through uh, uh, still um, a lot of the uh, Soviet and post-Soviet anti-Zionism. Uh, it came through the left. Um, so, D 
Durban was a really unsettling mixture, and of course through through, through Islamism as well. Uh, one of the preparation conferences of the Durban conference was held in Tehran, and none of the Jews were given visas until it was too late to travel. Um, and again, a lot of the Jews who went to Durban, they were not there as Jews, they were not there to fight anti-Semitism, they were there because they believed that they belonged in the global fight for human rights and against racism. And they discovered at Durban, goodness me, we don't belong here because anti-Semitic discourse is being treated as legitimate. Uh, and it's also interesting that it's also... Second, just to re-emphasize, what can we do when that anti-Semitic critique comes with the title human rights organization or human rights expert? So how, how, to, how to combat the, the, the yes. accusations when they come when from, come when down. they come with the banner of human yeah. rights? I mean, look, my view in general is actually to say that if we're serious about human rights, then we should be, then we don't embrace anti-Semitism. Also, my view is that to say that uh, if you are a halfway decent Marxist, you don't em embrace Stalinist anti-Semitism, or if you <laughs> believe in intersectionality, which was a very serious uh, uh, critique of um, anti-racism and, and feminism in, in the 70s, then you don't embrace anti-Semitism, and you, if you embrace critical theory, and you know, Adorno and Arendt and Horkheimer, and you don't embrace anti-Semitism. And all of those kind of threads have been kind of turned on themselves and, may, and turned upside down. So one strategy is to know more about it than the people who are pushing it, so, mm -hmm. to actually understand human rights better than the people who say that human rights can be protected uh, by siding with the people who murder Israelis and, and who blame, you know, Israel for murdering children out of pure evil. I just wanted to add that when you made the point about um, the people who supported the peace process and then the peace process collapsed and it went into, and then Durban and suddenly the, the, you had the re reigniting of Zionism and racism. It's interesting how, interesting to me at least, how, how, um, um, how easily and quickly those people found it to buy into the narrative that mm -hmm. the collapse of the peace process was mm -hmm. the fall of Israel. Yep. And all the evidence, if you bothered to look, yeah. was that the Palestinians who rejected, who rejected yeah. deals <laughs> and launched this, the Second Intifada. Oh, and, and it was, and the, this whole, this, this, that, that whole idea was, I think, you know, te, you know part, of the, part of this whole thing. Well, also specifically that Hamas was created to prevent the peace process from working, right? right? And, and the, the strategy Hamas to, to achieve that was to murder Israelis right. and to make Israelis believe that all Arabs wanted to kill them because that's what Hamas wanted Israelis to believe. So, so uh, yeah, there was something else. But... <laughs> no. okay. Yes, sir. Uh, I, I get very angry and also very upset by the way um, the situation is reported by the BBC and, and The Guardian. Um, how influential do you feel they are? In, in terms of public opinion, how influential the BBC and the Guardian? Yeah, versus in, public in, in, in terms of people who, who, who you said that about fifty percent who don't have a strong opinion, right, especially the fifty percent of the yeah. people, right? So I think that um, both the BBC and I think it's complicated. I I think I don't think it. Does. Okay, okay. Let, him, let it, you ask a question. Let him answer. It. I think that the BBC especially is built on a kind of ideology of balance. And, and everything depends upon where you put the center of, around which you balance. So if you have a balanced debate between anti-Semites and anti-anti-Semites, then you are legitimizing anti-Semitism because you're giving them a voice as a one legitimate half of a, of a legitimate debate. And I think The Guardian has often done that. And I think the BBC often does that. Uh, some of the BBC reporting on the current conflict uh, has been very upsetting indeed, uh, partly with their notion of balance. So when you have somebody, for example, from Israel talking about the hostages, that needs to be balanced <laughs> by what exactly? Um, and uh, um, 
So I, I think there is a real problem in how things are being reported. I mean, you, quite often also you have um, the Today program does not report that Israelis are overwhelmingly in, in support of the war against Hamas. And also it does not report the war against Hamas. It reports the running death toll of people uh, uh, who have died. The numbers of which come from the Gaza Health Ministry controlled by Hamas. Yeah. <laughs> That's, I mean, but imagine, imagine trying to report the Second World War, right? Oh, uh, you know, another thousand people in Warsaw have been bombed out of their homes. Oh, uh, let's talk to Mr. and Mrs. Schmidt from Dresden, who have had to endure a firestorm. Let's talk to someone in the East End of London who has been bombed. Let's talk to the boys running up the beach at, on D-Day. Oh my gosh, what's it like running into machine gun fire? Let's talk to the German women who were raped by Soviet soldiers. And all of it is true and all of it is real, but you would not understand anything about the Second World War if you only understood it as the suffering of innocence. And the BBC is very tempted to tell this as a story only of the suffering of innocence. And I don't know how many Israeli soldiers have died in this conflict since October the 7th, apart from the ones who died on October the 7th. That's the figure that I had in mind. How? How come if this is just a genocide? How, you know, why do Israeli soldiers die if there is a genocide? They don't. They die because they have been involved in a battle with Hamas. How is Hamas still fighting if that, you know, how they still have weapons, they still have uh, supplies, they still have fuel, they still have men. So the war is not reported. What is reported is, is individual and unrelated human tragedy. And it's balanced, you know, a Jewish human tragedy is balanced against another human tragedy. And, uh, and, and so people really don't have a chance of understanding what is going on. It reminds me of the coverage back in the day in the Second Intifada when BBC reports would give the, the death toll from the suicide bombing, and the death toll would include the suicide bombing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which I extraordinary. Yeah. Um, we lived on that recently. Okay, I can believe it. Um, okay, uh, one more question, and then we'll say goodbye. Yes, the lady at the back. Right, so thank you for tonight's very informative. And I just wanted to ask you that I have a lot of friends and family in London, and their biggest concern right now seems to be that the polls are pointing to the fact that Labour looks like it's going to be the mm -hmm. next government. And I know that many Jews in the Jewish community are, are liquidating some of their investments, they're buying homes in Israel, um, and I wondered what your your Insightfulness might lend to that. The question is about the question is about the polls which show that Labour are going to win the next election and, and what that means for business. So I am not worried in particular about the possibility of Labour winning the next election. In fact, it's quite likely that if there was an election tomorrow, I myself would vote Labour. Yeah. Um, because the reason people will vote Labour is because if they have an emergency in their household. They believe that it will. It might take four hours for the ambulance to arrive, and they want a new government um, because lots of things in Britain are not working, and because the Tories, you know, under David Cameron and Theresa May and Boris Johnson and uh, um, uh, yeah, it's not other, a other, other woman who was, who was <laughs> prime, minister, prime minister for a little while, and Richie Sunak. I mean, it, it 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 has no track record of fixing anything. So my friends who are the politicos, right, are really pleased with themselves at having defeated anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, and that's interesting. So what they've done is they have defeated anti-Semitism amongst the leadership of the Labour Party. And what they've done is they've defeated the machine that was supporting anti-Semitism in the Labour Party, the kind of Labour bureaucracy. What they haven't done is to change the big, broad, left, liberal uh, uh, constituency upon which the Labour Party sits. And that is a much more difficult problem. Um, 
so look, I think there are certainly problems with the Labour Party. There are certainly MPs that I would be very worried about. But if you ask me, you know, it's a it's it's a two horse race. I think it's completely legit, legit, legitimate for opponents of anti-Semitism to have their own politics if they want to support the Tories or the Labour Party. What is underlying that is all kinds of tendencies towards a, a uh, tri trivialness to democracy and to anti-Semitism and actually to other racisms across British society and uh, a real inability amongst many people in Britain to understand the importance of the democratic state. And those are bigger, deeper problems, and they are represented both on the left and the right of British politics and American politics too. Can you walk on the street with a keeper safely in the streets of London today? Yes. Yes. Can you have a sign of something Jewish okay. you feel safe on the street? That's my a question I have. Okay, so that'll be the final question. <laughs> 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 it, we British Israelis suddenly have the opportunity to vote, which we, I mean, we've been in Israel for 46 years, and it's just recently been decided that we can vote in mm -hmm. Britain, like the Americans, our American friends, around, and it's a dilemma. Mm -hmm. well, should we? Uh, uh, okay, so I want to, okay, so <laughs> I just want to, that, that, that's, that's not really a question, it's just, although it, I think it's well, interesting I what he, what he thinks about it. Yeah. I mean, okay, I, I think it's a personal, I think it's a personal, I think it's a personal well, question, but, but the, the lady's question right at the end was if if British Jews can feel comfortable walking down the street wearing kippah. Yeah. So look, generally, I would say yes. Uh, but there are, you know, there are incidences in which, of course, it's not possible. Um, there are spikes in anti-Semitism when there is conflict in, involving Israel. There is also... Uh, uh, all sorts of other dangers on the streets of Britain. Um, there is, there are also spikes of Islamophobia. I mean, there are Muslims who get attacked, who have their hijabs pulled off them, uh, uh, who who get denounced as terrorists as they walk down the street, being completely peaceable. Um, and those things go up during times of conflict. But in general, I would say. Uh, be careful, but yeah, more or less. What, central London? Um, yeah. Okay, okay, this, yeah. I, I don't want to get into it. Sorry, to, to, sure, go for the it. last thing in terms of how uh, uh, Jews should vote, what we would like to see is for Jews not to have to vote as Jews, right? right? We would like to have a situation where Jews can vote according to their politics. And um, I think the choice between the Labour Party and the Tories is pretty well uh, there at this moment. Right. Yeah. I mean, I just just to say for people that don't know British <laughs> politics that there's a the reason why the the Labour are so far ahead of the polls is because the, the, there is a lot of there's a lot of um, uh, dislike of the of the Tory government that's been in power for a very long time. So I think that that will be that you know Jews would Jews Jew, British Jews would ship would, would share in that dislike of the government any, no less than other Brits. I think. Yeah, but, I mean, look, so much in Britain is not working at the moment, right. and uh, many many people want to see a new government. Um, right. Okay. Um, I want to thank David Hirsch very much for joining us. Um, thank you for coming. Go to uh, LondonAntisemitism.com to check out the website and the. Uh, and the fabulous publications that, that are being produced there and the work that David and his colleagues are doing. Um, we have um, more events coming up both in person and on Zoom. You can go to our website, our Facebook page. If you're not on my mailing list, drop me an email, paulg at beganscentre.org.il. I should say, especially if it's British, there's lots of Bristol in the room, it's Begin Centre spelled the incorrect American way, so C-D-N-T-E-R. Um, okay, thank you everyone, good night. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.